For as long as I can remember, we've had a president that half the people generally like and half the people generally don't like. And repeat, repeat again, one more time, and there it is. Regardless of what political party it is, no recent president has really been a unifying figure among the American people. My question is, when was the last time we had a great president? When I say great, I don't mean great in terms of their character or their policies. I mean great as in a leader who was able to inspire and unify the American people during their time. In the 46 years between Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt's presidencies, there was a period that I would refer to as the period of presidential mediocrity. It was a period of transition, taking us roughly from the Civil War to World War I. I would argue that we're currently living in another period of presidential mediocrity. It's hard to be objective about a historical period while you're living through it, and boy did we live through it. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> I do want to preface this by saying that the individual isn't everything. I'm not really a fan of great man history, where major turning points in the world can be attributed to one exceptionally powerful individual. The idea that one person can solve all of our problems is itself very problematic and ignores the rest of the political environment. But even if it's not everything, I would argue that the person sitting in the chair and making the decisions is still very, very important. In addition to that, the president is also the head of state. It's not like the UK where head of state and head of government are different jobs. A great president needs to be both a master of politics and policy. So now I'm going to ask another question. What makes a president great? To answer this question, I sought the work of Jonathan Darman. I recommend checking him out because a lot of the information in this video came from Darman's books and interviews that he gave about them. I want to preface this by saying that while I try my best, I am only human and it's possible that I might make some mistakes. If you notice anything at all, please feel free to leave it in the comment section down below, hopefully in a respectful manner, but this is the internet after all. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe and do the rest of the YouTube stuff as well. If you're feeling generous, I've also started a PayPal, which is linked in the description down below. This channel isn't monetized, and I do all the work for the videos myself, which can be quite time consuming, so any help that you can give is very appreciated. First, let's talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. As you can see, FDR is sitting down in this wonderful little bobblehead that I have, which is a little uncommon for presidential bobbleheads. You might be asking yourself, why isn't he standing up? And the answer is because he couldn't. If you don't know by now, FDR was diagnosed with polio at the relatively young age of 39, which took away his ability to walk. Polio ripped up FDR's life plan because he needed to spend seven years away from politics rehabilitating himself. People don't talk about this a lot, but before the polio diagnosis, FDR had a pretty lengthy career. He had been a state senator, assistant secretary of the Navy, and even a vice presidential nominee. Remember when I said that great presidents have legacies that other politicians try to imitate? Well, sometimes those imitators become great presidents themselves, and this was the case with FDR. Prior to his polio diagnosis, FDR really wanted to be like his cousin Teddy Roosevelt, who had been a great president himself. He even used the word bully and tried to be the new Roosevelt in town in a superficial way. FDR had progressive ideas, but they weren't really rooted in much substance at first. At this point, he also lacked the powerful rhetorical skills that we associate so strongly with his presidency. He was a promising young man, but he wasn't the FDR that we know today. It really seems like every great president needs something to come along and knock them out of their sense of certainty. For Theodore Roosevelt, it was his wife and mother passing away on the same day in the same house. For Franklin Roosevelt, it was his polio diagnosis that forced him to change his outlook on life and develop different life skills. The thing about imitating a previous great president is that the next Teddy Roosevelt doesn't look like Teddy Roosevelt. You can't just try to be like the last great leader. Their time has passed and what a great leader looks like in your time is probably going to be different. Politicians today often use hope as a buzzword, an empty platitude that doesn't really mean much. But what is hope really and why is it something important for a great president to have? 
If you ever get a chance, you should ask a politician when they most needed hope in their lives and how that experience shaped them as a person. FDR was set on this idea that he was gonna walk again. So he had to commit himself to long-term plans of rehabilitation that might not work out. This gave him a tolerance for uncertainty. FDR could make a decision and then leave it be until the time was right. During World War II, FDR wouldn't know the consequences of wartime decisions for months at a time, which is something he had to learn to be comfortable with. During the Great Depression, FDR could enact policies with long-term goals and then stick to them. He could connect with the country to look past the present struggles and toward a more hopeful future because that's what he had to do with polio. The United States is a giant nation with so many people. In times of crisis, a great leader can seize the opportunity. Everyone lives in different realities with different challenges. Even just the rural-urban divide makes it hard for people to understand each other's struggle. Regardless of if you think the New Deal benefited the American people or not, FDR excelled in bringing people together during a time of suffering for everyone and responding directly to their concerns. Unemployment remains a serious problem. Roosevelt's fireside chats weren't anything super special rhetorically, but they were dense deliveries of information in a straight manner, much like a doctor would have had to address FDR with regarding his polio. People want details. FDR knew what it felt like to face a great challenge. In that situation, people want to know what's going on, and there's no such thing as too many details. Whether it's a polio diagnosis or the state of the economy, you're going to want to know what's going on. If FDR never had polio, he still might have been president, but I don't think he would have been a great president. This is the power of a midlife crisis, a common theme when looking at the lives of powerful leaders. An experience that challenges them and forces them to self-reflect and evolve. As we look at further presidents, we'll learn how different men learn lessons that help them make their mark on American history. We all know that FDR was a strong politician and a strong policy maker. I would argue that the politician knows how to get elected to a position of power, and the policymaker knows how to wield that power. The politician is a good orator, and the policymaker is a good executive. Much like FDR was inspired by Teddy Roosevelt's presidencies, various future presidents would be inspired by FDR. I would argue that two other 21st century presidents are FDR's true successors, each one embodying a different aspect of his leadership style. Lyndon B. Johnson filled the role of policymaker, while Ronald Reagan filled the role of politician. Though Reagan became president 18 years after Johnson, the two men were only three years apart in age and shared a lot of similar experiences. Both men worked on their family ranches, which led to them romanticizing the great American cowboy. These two future presidents were young men during the Great Depression and in turn were very inspired by Franklin Roosevelt. Though that inspiration would take Johnson and Reagan in very different directions, both would ultimately reach the grand destination that is the presidency, with the help of a good old midlife crisis along the way, just like their shared idol. LBJ was in politics nearly his entire life. During the 1950s, Johnson had been the Senate Majority Leader and the second most powerful man in the country. After a failed presidential bid in the 1960 election, LBJ joined the Kennedy administration as his vice president at 55 years old. This was a giant step down. As Senate Majority Leader, Johnson had known immense power, something he craved and frankly knew how to yield very well. LBJ felt humiliated by the vice presidency. To put it plainly, he was just depressed. Ronald Reagan was a B-list actor and Screen Actors Guild president before losing his job with GE Theater. Well, those are some of the things we've done with lighting in our home. Might give you some ideas to help you see better and look better and live better in your home and to make your surroundings more colorful and cheerful. He ended up playing a villain in the film The Killers, which is the kind of role that he hates. <laughs> During times of personal crisis, people learn how to handle hardship and uncertainty. These are very important qualities for a leader to have. Both these men were at serious low points in their lives, but they would go on to each win landslide elections. While landslides aren't necessarily required to be a great president, I would be lying if I said that there was no correlation. Here's a look at the electoral victories of the three presidents that we've discussed so far. FDR, LBJ, and RWR, 
I have never heard anyone call Ronald Reagan RWR. All three men had midlife crises. So crises. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned our current period of presidential mediocrity. And it's no coincidence that this period started directly after our last presidential landslide. Roosevelt and Johnson won landslides and enacted their policy vision. Reagan won a landslide too, but he couldn't enact as much policy. Instead, he would give the country more of a philosophical vision. Reagan was the great communicator. His greatest strength was always being able to share his ideas in a convincing way. FDR could get lots of people to agree with him using rhetoric that would be considered divisive today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. In the same speech where he says that peace and goodwill are going to save the republic. In this instance, he is unifying the American people against a specific problem that is being faced by all of them. This works so well because FDR sincerely believes in his message. Reagan embodies the politician half of FDR's leadership style, while Johnson embodies the policymaker. LBJ wants to be a better president than Kennedy and as great of a president as FDR, and he was going to do it by pushing through legislation. With his great society programs that expanded on the New Deal, LBJ made grand promises for what the government could do to improve American life. Some people saw these ambitious promises as being too detached from reality. This gave someone like Reagan the ability to come in and say, government isn't gonna fix your problem, government is the problem. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means, and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities, and on these principles there will be no compromise. These ideologies facing off against each other head to head caused a lot of political polarization. Ronald Reagan was so popular that his sitting VP, George Bush, won the presidency directly after him. This might not sound too crazy, but it literally hasn't happened since. Starting with George H.W. Bush, it's been red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. There hasn't been a presidential landslide since Reagan in 1984, and after that, the Republicans only won the popular vote twice in the last 38 years. Fun fact, that is nearly twice as long as I have been alive. I was born in 2001, the first year of the George W. Bush administration. Bush had a midlife crisis himself, having struggled with alcoholism for a really long time. He stopped drinking at age 40 through sheer force of will, which is an incredible accomplishment for someone in that situation. Quitting alcohol as an alcoholic is an extremely difficult thing, but its virtue didn't exactly translate into being a great president. People liked that George Bush was such a disciplined man, which was a big contrast from Clinton in the 90s. Bush was called the NBA president. He was bringing professionalism back to the White House, running it like a business, but also running it with a level of certainty that wasn't present in the Johnson or Reagan administrations. Unlike the previous presidents that we discussed, Bush doesn't gain the same sort of midlife crisis skepticism. Quitting alcohol taught Bush certainty, but certainty isn't exactly a great quality in a great leader all of the time. The mentality of, but I'm the decider and I decide what is best, doesn't really work that well in such complex situations. It takes more than just having a midlife crisis. Your midlife crisis has to actually teach you the right lesson. America seemed invincible before 9-11, which a lot of people took for granted. George Bush could have done whatever he wanted for a few months. His approval rating was through the roof, but he was an unaffected leader. <laughs> Maybe he'll play with the band. He cracks me up when he's dancing, yeah. and he's done it so many times in public. He <sighs> obviously trying to fit in. Everyone was jointly mad about one thing, which is incredibly rare in American politics. For a moment, there was unity, and Bush could have used that unity for whatever he wanted. He decided to channel that unity into the Iraq war, and we all know how that went. Bush was set on a path, but with the wrong lesson. Like I said before, the individual isn't everything in history, but the individual is everything in modern American politics. There's a lot of celebrity factors at play. If you think about it, the president is the biggest celebrity in the world. As much as we romanticize their greatness, presidents have needed to operate within a conventional party system. 
Teddy Roosevelt tried to break the mold with the Bull Moose Party after not winning the Republican nomination and he failed. By the way, I have a whole separate video on that, which you should definitely check out after this one. Being Teddy Roosevelt wasn't enough to get you the presidency without having the party structure. But today, our politics are much more driven by the individual and influencer culture, to the point where I think Teddy Roosevelt would probably win if he ran as a bull moose today. What a great leader looks like is an ever-changing concept, and there's no way to really predict what that's going to be for a given era. What makes a great president today isn't exactly what's going to make a great president tomorrow. Different strengths are needed for different challenges. This video is a lot more about asking questions than giving answers to specific questions, so any feedback that you might have or any musings that you might have on the situation are always very welcome in the comments below. I know it's been a minute since I last uploaded, but hopefully we're back on a consistent schedule again and we're going to have a lot more conversations here. If you enjoy the video, please remember to like and subscribe and consider donating to the PayPal if you want to help out.